All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the first Lunchlytics of the season. My name is Dana. I'm an analyst with Dark Horse Analytics. I'm not Dan, but he'll be joining us a little bit later. Um, so just before we get started, a couple questions. Is this anyone's first time at a Lunchalytics? Any first timers in the room? Excellent, plenty. All right, so we'd like to get a feel for what type of people are in the audience. So who here is a consumer of analytics? So someone who maybe works on the business side and uses um, analytical data. Okay, a couple. Um, who here is a producer of analytics? Someone who actually works in analytics? Okay, um, academics, students in the room? Okay, a couple. And anyone who doesn't fall into one of those categories that I've missed? <laughs> cool, what area do you work in? Sorry, I know you have a mouthful there. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so we've got um, our topic today is going to be machine learning, and in an awesome coincidence, both of our speakers do work in robotics, so it'll be a pretty exciting talk. Um, so without further ado, I will bring up Sean Scheidemann. Right. Thank you, Dana, for the introduction. Um, as she said, I'm a master's student at the University of Alberta. My research interest is visual navigation for robots. And the talk I'm going to be giving today is about um, a project I did this past, this past summer related to underwater uh, robotics and deep learning. So just to give you a background of how I got into underwater robotics, um, there's a club at the university called ARVP. It's the Autonomous Robotic Vehicle Project. And it's a group of undergraduate students and graduate students who basically every year, well, we reuse the same robot year over year, but um, we go to a competition in San Diego, which is an autonomous underwater robot. So that's, that's a robot on the right there. It's, as you can see, it looks kind of like an X-Wing from Star Wars. That's how they designed it. <laughs> um, so the competition, like I said, it's fully autonomous and happens in San Diego at this uh, naval research pool that they let us use. But the competition is very well defined. You have um, tasks that you need to complete. Uh, for every task you do, you get points, and that's how you win. So, but like I said, there's the tasks are well defined. Like you know the shapes of the objects, um, colors, all that sort of stuff. Um, so last year we did pretty good. We got ninth place overall out of 44 teams. And I just show these numbers because a big part of why we did so well was um, because of our computer vision system. So, um, so what is the problem? So we're trying to basically uh, find objects of interest in the image, and we can use those to navigate. So um, wh why would we want to use deep learning? Like in this situation, the buoy is pretty easy to see. Um, you could probably use a pretty naive method to uh, threshold based off of color and then find the biggest blob, and that would be your buoy. Um, but in a situation like that, um, where the color, your um, variable illumination uh, colors start to attenuate the deeper you go underwater. So it starts to get harder to just use these more naive methods for uh, de detection. And this is another image of buoy. This is from farther away. Like in this pool, this is a U of A pool. You'd be able to clearly see those buoys, but in the competition pool, it almost gets hard to see. Um, and then this last image is just showing caustics on the buoys. So those are light flickers that happen underwater and those are also hard to deal with. So the reason why we chose a deep learning approach was because um, it's really hard to hand engineer like a feature that's going to be invariant to like illumination and caustics and all that. So we decided to go with the deep learning approach and train the model to uh, filter out those sort of things uh, with training data. So. Um, Again, object detection, so we want to find bounding boxes around objects of interest. Um, our requirements for this project was that it is real time and that it handles multiple classes and also that it can be deployed easily on our hardware. So we experimented with a few different object detection frameworks that are out there. Um, 
I listed a bunch here. I didn't try out all of these, but there's, there's many others out there. Um, so their framework of choice really came down to what was the easiest to deploy. So um, this, this system over there, the NVIDIA TX1 Jetson, it's our, it's our embedded, um, it's like NVIDIA's embedded uh, sort of single board computer, which has a little credit card size GPU. So you can actually take advantage of some of the uh, NVIDIA's CUDA library for GPU acceleration. Um, we ended up choosing YOLO, which maybe some of you have heard of it, but uh, the reason why is because the neural net framework it uses is Darknet, and that's written in C, and it was really easy to integrate into our existing C++ code base. Um, and it checks off some of our other things, like it's, it is fast enough, like it's only three to four frames per second on a TX1 or TX2, but um, that's, we can make that work for our application. And then it's also very easy to train it from multiple classes. So in Yolo's paper, they used like, they showed that they could train it with like 9,000 object classes. Um, so to go more into Darknet in Yolo, Darknet is, like I said, uh, open source neural network library written in C and CUDA. Um, YOLO stands for you only look once. It's a real time object detection system. Um, so it, it takes, the reason why it's called you only look once is because it takes an image and it directly outputs a bunch of bounded boxes. It, don't, it only needs to look at the image once. Um, so compared to like previous methods of doing it, um, they would use like a slide and window approach, or maybe they'd use a neural net to find regions of interest, and then they'd apply a classifier onto those regions. And so they would be applying the same network many times over the image, and that's not very efficient. Whereas YOLO, it does it once, and then, so it's, it's faster. Um, so how does it do it? So it treats the problem, it treats it as a regression problem. So it's regressing on the uh, X, Y coordinates of the bounded box, as well as the width, height, confidence of the bounded box, as well as the class probabilities for each one. So first, you can see here, it splits the image into a 13 by 13 grid. For each uh, cell of the grid, it predicts five bounded boxes. Um, you can change that number to whatever you want, but five is what most people use. And then for our problem, we had five classes we wanted to detect. Um, so for each region, it's gonna find uh, these X, Y with height, confidence, plus uh, the probability that it is each of those classes. And then times that by five. For, so you, get, you end up with a bunch of, quite a few bounded boxes, as you can see in the middle image, and those end up getting thresholded out based off the confidence. You only keep the ones you're the most confident in. Um, and so the final output layer is this 13 by 13 by 50 uh, matrix that has all the information you need in it. So for our data set, we, uh, we, took, we had collected about 40 videos from both the U of A pool plus the competition pool. And we split them into, we took three of them, and that was our test set. Um, went and put it under a rock, and then the rest, well, all of it, we hand labeled. We did the tedious process of hand labeling. It took quite a bit of time, but at the end, we got about 10,000 training set images, and then 3,000 test set images. And these are just the breakdowns of instances of the objects over the 10,000 images. As you can see, we didn't get very many inverted gates in our uh, test set, our training set, whereas we got, we, so we didn't really plan that out because in the test, test set, we got like 1,300 versus 200 in the training set, but <coughs> that was just a, we didn't really think about it beforehand. Um, for training, we, uh, we um, used AWS P2 instances. So we use a single, one of their single P2X large instances, which has a, NVIDIA K80 GPU in it, which was more than enough for our, what we were doing. And basically, you start off with like pre-trained, with pre-trained convolutional layers for your network, and then um, you start training on your own data. And that took us, with 50 epics, um, about 14 hours of training time. And yeah, this just shows some of the details about P2 instances. Um, 
So now for the results, um, this is our model on the uh, running on the test set. So it's or a portion of the test set. So you can see like even from a distance, it's able to detect the buoys and it's also detecting the right colors too, even when it's like for me, I can hardly tell the difference between the red buoy and the yellow buoy at that distance. And the green buoy, I, I can hardly see. So, um, and it's getting the inverted gate and the path as well. So we were pretty happy with these results. Um, this is, uh, yeah, this is also, this is just another on a different portion of the test set. It's similar water conditions, but again, uh, it's doing well. And you can see on the buoys, there's the cost that I was talking about. Those, those, no problem. So um, we were happy about that. So how we evaluated our models. Um, we used intersection over union of a threshold of greater than 0 0.5 to classify it as a, a true positive. Um, intersection over union is just the intersection of the ground truth bounding box versus what the model predicts over the union of those two bounding boxes. So if that's greater than 0.5, it's a true positive. Um, so uh, the red buoy was definitely like we had the best results with. We also had the most training images for it, but also because um, it's red in color and it's a circle. So it's pretty, I think it's pretty easy to, for the model to detect that. Um, and then the green buoy was definitely like the hardest to see. So the accuracy for that one drops off quite a bit. Um, one thing I want to mention about the path is the average intersection over union over the test set was only about 56%. Um, percent. And I, th I think that's mostly because the path is like this long skinny um, thing on the bottom of the pool. So a lot of the bounding boxes end up becoming uh, weird shape or just not the right, like they'll be wider than necessary or they'll be shorter. And then so you get, you get a poor average IOU, which leads to poor per precision. But if, you, if we decrease that threshold from 0 0.5 to 0 0.3, then the precision actually jumps up to like 99 and the accuracy to like 80. Um, and again, the inverted gate, we only had 231 training set images. So, our, so the precision was pretty low for that one, meaning we had a lot of false positives. Um, so the next steps, um, we, for one thing, the competition might be changing a lot this year. So we're not sure if all the tasks are gonna be there. So a lot of like our current object detector might not be useful, but also there's a lot of tasks which we just don't have training data for. So we're actually looking into ways to get more training data. So um, what we're one way to do that is to use the U of A pool, build models, um, little like build the tasks, put them in the pool and get footage. But obviously the U of A pool is not um, the same conditions as the competition pool. So what we're doing is actually trying to <coughs> use simulated images. So on the right there, you can see that's a Unity simulator we built. And uh, like we're not, so it, it's not that great of quality, but we did some initial tests with it and on just the red buoy class. And we did, so we did real images, then synthetic images, then real plus synthetic images, train in the network, train in the model. And what we saw was that for just synthetic images, it did really poorly. Um, but when you combine the real and synthetic images, it actually increased the overall precision by like 8% from the re just using the real. And, but it did slightly decrease the accuracy by like 1%. So we're, we're not sure if it's a a like a viable method, but we're gonna look more into it. Um, so this, um, this is a video from the competition in the summer. Can I play it or do I just? There's the audio, um, but it's just showing um, our semifinal run from last year. Um, so and us do, and doing the buoy task using our uh, our detector. So the initial phase, it just bowls through that first gate. Um, we just point it and it goes. But then at this stage, it actually searches for the buoys. And you'll see it, uh, it goes for the red buoy first. And it'll go in and hit it, and then it backs up and goes for the yellow buoy, then the green buoy. But 
that's yeah. So I can start answering questions now if anybody. Yeah. So those images you see are related. Right? So you take a picture here and then move one step forward and take another picture and it goes to pictures that are possibly related. Yeah. And you somehow use that to the training. Uh, no, we're not using like any sort of recurrent neural nets or anything like that, but um, yeah. And a lot of our training data is very similar because we're, we're taking like the video, 30 frames per second, we're chopping it down to five frames per second, but those five frames are still pretty similar, but I don't know, we, we needed data, so we just reused a lot. Um, Um, so we, we program that beforehand. Uh, we have a state machine. We decide like what we want to do, like red buoy, yellow buoy, and then green buoy. If, you know, if it fails to find something, then it will, you know, preempt and go to the next task. But so you have a rating of a priority. Which one to first? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So it's not that you have to do it in the shortest time, as long as you do yeah. all the tests. So the way the tasks work is you get you get points for each one you complete. If you finish early, you do get bonus points, but we've never gotten to the point where we've completed enough tasks for that to be uh, a good method. Um, yep. Could follow up to your, your environment there. Do you guys ever see halo flying for like different densities? You see cross dips, but you see different water density, extreme samples like freshwater is all mm. right. Do you ever do you ever deal with that or no. Yeah. <laughs> the the competition pool is only um, and yeah, we don't really we don't really see any like varying densities or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys to use other sensors something like Chrono? Yeah, so a lot of like the top teams will use um, like DVLs, which is a Doppler velocity log, and it allows you to track the bottom of the pool and then get your velocity. So that would be like super handy. It's almost like a necessary for underwater robots, but we just, our club just doesn't have enough money for it. So we're always looking for donations. For the, oh, for the images? Um, no, we don't really do anything with that. Right. Right. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any? Yeah. You mentioned that uh, at training time you started with a pre-trained model. How did you choose the model to start with? So that's we actually just use something that you can download off the uh, YOLO website. So they just train it on ImageNet, um, uh, that a thousand class data set. And so that's already pre-trained, and you just use that to start off. And was so that, that was it useful at all, though, because you're looking for very specific. Yeah, I think it was. I think it is very useful because um, it learns a lot of like the low level, like because this it's a deep neural net. So like some of the lower layers are learning like simple edges and shapes and things like that. So like I showed that image. Um, maybe I'll just can I, oh, but. Yeah, can I? This? Oh. So, like, this is just using um, a trained network on, like, trained on no underwater images. And in, so it detected those as sports balls. But um, so I think there is, like, sharing of those features, those low level features. Yeah. Um, you were talking about, like, the challenge getting training data mm -hmm. um, and, and the you know, and then you're simulating some, looking at simulating some to get it. But the whole robo stuff in general, like the pools are a simulation of a deep sea right. environment. Is it possible for you to look at getting access to video of actual underwater subs? Yeah. I, we, I don't think we've ever tried to do that, but we could. And definitely, because I think they're going to change the competition to be more, um, less focused on vision. So maybe, it, so. They'll probably try to make it more real world. So in that case, we would need real world um, situations to. Yeah. Is that is that good? Yeah. All right. Uh, go ahead. 
just get your comparison with these two motion pictures, right? Mm -hmm. These real images. Did you try the real images after the two motion to see if that one as well? Or did you just combine? Like, did you not get free audio? Um, so the way we did that experiment was we just trained the model on real images to start, uh, evaluated it, then we trained a fresh model on just uh, synthetic, and then we did a comp. Then we trained the model on combination of the two. Is that? So what I'm asking is after you've done it on after you've done that combination, yeah. you try it again on just the real images to see if the simulated. Oh, one, so. I see. Yeah. So that that's what we did do. So we that was still evaluated on our test set, which was just real images. Okay, so it was before that. All right. Mm. Um, anybody? Go ahead. Can you briefly outline what the structure of the neural network itself was? Like how many layers were there? Right, so there's, this is, um, this is from the first YOLO paper. We're actually using YOLO v2, but it's very similar. Um, there's about 24 convolutional layers. And then there's uh, two fully connected layers. And then there's a bunch, there's some max pooling layers, which they use to uh, down sample our, yeah. Right the front end. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's kind of, they use, com they use convolution, uh, com like filters of one by one or three by three. Mostly. Um, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Any more questions? Optimize the uh, the Yeah, yeah. So that's something we I think we'd like to do once if we get to the point where we can do enough tasks. Like even just doing the buoy task, we were able to get ninth place. But um, it, I don't know. There's a there's kind of like a big gap between like the top seven teams and then the rest because. Top seven teams usually have a big budget. Um, that, like they have that DVL I was talking about, um, which makes a big difference. Yeah, the like core was like on top of yeah. The yeah, they, they're still using vision, but they don't rely on it as much as we do. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm assuming that the pre trained model, you said the pre trained model was trained on image, so it was trained on a whole bunch of classes before you'd ever seen it. Did you take that final software X layer, toss it off, and add your own at the end with your classes? Or did you like co-opt classes in the existing class layer? Um, yeah, no, so we, add, we, we do what you said first. We chop off the end and put our own classes on it. But um, yeah, basically we're just, you're taking all the weights for the convolutional layers and you're using those pre-trained ones. And then you have your, your final layers based on your number of classes at the end. Yeah. Yeah. So just with that question, so if you cut off, say, motorbikes no longer, <clears throat> motorbikes no longer going to be recognized? Yeah. And it just looks for the buoys and the answer? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We only, yeah, we have, we trained it for five classes. You can train it on however many numbers you want. Um, when you trained on those five classes, uh, you take a sample of each class as uh, instances of that class. But did you, like, is it possible to do more of the examples that you consider now? Like, you have to, if you have any. Oh. Effect. So give it, like, instances of. Like, if, if you want to detect red blue, the red uh, blue. Then you give uh, positive examples of the mm -hmm. You also give negative examples of the things that you're not Right. I think that probably would help overall. I think the more training data you're giving it, the more classes um, just overall is going to help. But we didn't we didn't really do that. <clears throat> well, I guess you could just. Sorry, say that again. Is it possible for you to Not, I guess not like explicitly saying these are negative examples, but you could just train on like six classes instead of five. Um, yeah. That's.
All right, thank you so much. All right, so while our next speaker is getting mic'd up, I just wanted to bring attention to a couple things on our website. Um, so I know this is, um, a few of you have seen this before, but on our website, we have the list of all of our past speakers as well as links to the videos. So if you miss any of our events, um, you can always go back and watch some of the older ones and see who we brought in. If you're interested at, uh, in speaking at Lunchalytics, um, if you're doing any cool work or have a project or a problem you want to talk about, um, come and talk to me after. We're always looking for new speakers. And if you want to sponsor, that's always exciting because you get to get a bit of time in front of an analytically minded audience and most importantly, you get to pick the food that we eat, which is always awesome. Um, for upcoming events, there is a data analytics and machine learning conference happening next month that we've um, linked to on here as well as on our job board, um, we've got a couple postings, including one for a developer position within Dark Horse, which is open until tomorrow, which doesn't give you much notice, but it's there. Um, does anyone else have any other job announcements they want to bring up? Is anyone else hiring? Students in January. Sorry? Students in January. Cool, for what kind of, what kind of work? Uh, for enterprise. Awesome, so if that is a fit to you, uh, for, for you, we could chat afterwards. Is there anyone here in the room looking for work? Is it for you? Okay, cool. What kind of data do you decide for? Pardon me? Data um, It's the, I just closed it, the DAMA. Do you know what that sounds for off the top of your head, Magic? Okay, okay. Um, the, I've got the link to the, the website up there. It was one that um, Dan had wanted me to talk about. But I haven't attended it in the past, but I don't know too many details, unfortunately. But it's all there for you. Cool. Ready to go? Cool, yep. All right, so I'd like to introduce you to Patrick Polarski. Hey, buddy. All right, so this is going to be slightly different, maybe diametrically opposed to the, the approach in the last talk. So uh, ignore the boring title. I had to put a title. Um, First, before we jump in, I want to do a little straw poll. Those of you who actually work with, like, how many of you get your hands work with, like, big masses of data? Okay, cool. And of those people who work with big masses of data, how many sort of collect your big mass of data beforehand and then do something with it? And how many of you, yeah, big show of hands, how many people do something like that? How many people sort of let that data sort of wash over them and do stuff with it as it's coming in? Cool, okay, good. So. Uh, mostly thinking to the two that raised their hands there and trying to convince the others this is a cool idea. Um, okay, first before I start, this is all you may work that I'm going to talk to you about. I am with DeepMind. This is not DeepMind stuff, just as a uh, just quick disclaimer. Okay, um, machine intelligence is something that I think is really powerful. I think we saw an example of it in the last talk, which I think was awesome. I wish I could go see that and play with robots. I just get to play with robots. Um, but uh, the, the big promise, I think, with machine intelligence is that it can actually impact quality of life for people who use technology. My line of work at the university, that's people who've lost body parts. I work with people who've had amputations, and we look at trying to glue a robot arm onto their body so that they can use it like their own biological limb. Um, and that's the study I'm going to cast this talk in. But really, I want to I present two views on using data, and using data especially as it's coming in. In a, in a giant fire hose of data. One is, is that assistive devices, could be smartphones, but really here we're going to talk about buying body parts, um, can actually perform learning in real time and decision making in real time as the data is coming in, uh, which is just, it's a contrasting compatible viewpoint to, to the last talk where you actually take a, you train on a data set and then you deploy it in real time. This is both training and deployment can happen in real time. So if you don't have anything else that I talk except the cool videos I'm going to show you next, um, I want to try and convince you that this is something that is very, very appealing. I'm a reinforcement learning researcher. I do reinforcement learning fundamental theory and also applications. And this is really a reinforcement learning kind of viewpoint. Uh, view two, and this is some very cool new work that we're doing on human motion analysis. I thought I'd slide in, given the audience, uh, is that we can actually analyze data, sometimes in real time, to make better devices that allow people and machines to interact. Um, and I'll talk a little about both of these views. Is that cool? Uh, for any short time, I may just sort of gloss over YouTube because I just want to show you cool videos of people using binary body parts. Okay, so view one is I'm going to talk about not just binary body parts, but brain body machine interfaces. Often you think of sticking wires into people's brains or the nervous system, but it's really a bigger thing than that. Anytime we have people interacting with technology, especially in a more intimate way, like, uh, like some kind of assistive technology in rehab, you have two systems working together in partnership and they're trying to do something together. 
They're trying to work together. Um, and in most settings, especially rehab settings, you have one set, one of those two intelligent systems is directing the show. That's the person. And the machine is typically assisting. They're trying to achieve the goals of the director, in this case, the person. Cool? Um, so here's one example. I love this example from down in Pittsburgh. Uh, this is Jan Sherman working as a research participant in the BrainGate project. Um, what you might not see if you didn't look carefully is there see these two gray things on top of Jan's head. Um, Jan's paralyzed from the neck down. Those are plugs directly into Jan's brain, the two regions of her brain. Uh, just by thinking, Jan is actually controlling that robotic arm to feed herself a chocolate bar. This is an awesome example of a brain-body-machine interface. Uh, Jan is thinking things that she's thinking about, uh, ways that she can move that arm into her mouth. And in this case, like, total win, Jan's able to feed herself a chocolate bar. Uh, and there's like all the pictures, and like, wow, this is amazing. But really, this is an awesome case of a machine helping to project Jan into the world the way she couldn't before. They're working together to achieve a shared goal. Um, and there's all sorts of stuff with silly strings and all sorts of other stuff. Um, but this is one example of, of a brain-body machine interface. Uh, I'd like to highlight here just one thing that I'll keep coming back to the whole talk, and that there's this awesome fire hose of data coming out of Jan's brain into the machine. And what links them together is that there is an analysis that the, that, that data is being processed, it's being processed in real time. It has some kind of model that's been learned to map these patterns of neural activity, the, the, the blinking lights in Jan's brain, to the motions of that arm. In this case, the algorithm is actually fairly straightforward, but there's many more complex things you might imagine. Okay, cool. Everyone, like, if nothing else, you saw a cool video of, uh, of like, the matrix <laughs> plugging the brain. Okay, um, good. So the other example, this is, a, this is also a brain-body machine interface, but in this case, this is Jesse Sullivan. He's a lineman down at Rehab Institute of Chicago, one of their, their participants. Um, lost both his arms and the shoulder due to electrical accident. And uh, here, uh, Jesse's actually had his nervous system rewired. We do the surgery up here in Alberta as well. It's a way of restringing the nerves of the body into different places. And instead of plugging into his brain, in this case, uh, Jesse is controlling this robotic arm through the skin, the muscles of his, of his torso and his residual, his residual tissue. So he's, he's thinking about closing his hand, the muscles of his body contract. The machine is measuring signals from his body, not directly from the brain, but from the brain by way of bits of his body. It's another setting where there's dense stream of information. Maybe not quite as dense as the one that, that we saw from Jan, but maybe even greater in frequency, um, is, being, is being used to move the different body parts of this robotic limb. And there's like pattern recognition, there's like supervised learning going on there too. It's, a, it's another example of that same case. But I'm going to show you a different case, and I think it's the same case. Um, and then who has a dog? Where's all right, anyway, so those of you that have dogs have maybe gone through this where you, you like bring home a new puppy and you have this intelligent system that's sitting in your house like peeing all over your carpets. And, and over time, you work with the dog to try to come together on some shared understanding. You try to work together as a team. And so some of you go from this, my wife, with our, our puppy, and yeah, he, we just kept checking on the side to figure out to pee outside. Um, but we go from that to, to something like this. This is I'm going dog skiing with my dog. So the dog now, we've, we've grown up, this is like a year and a half later, we work together, I'm attached to him by a rope, he's pulling on skis, I say left and right, slow down, and he's figured out how to pull me on skis. We've developed some way of working together, interpreting the information flowing back and forth between us, such that, that we're able to work together to do something I couldn't do by myself, which is move this fast on skis. I'm not really that good at cross-country skiing. Um, but this is exactly the same setting we see with people interacting with their assistive technologies. Uh, and what's important here is that both systems are learning. And they're learning continually from a stream of information that's continually flowing between them. Okay, so this is a case of real-time big data. Yeah, dogs, dogs are big data. Um, let's just cast this back and double the prosthetics. Prosthetics, for those who don't aren't familiar with it, are devices, that, uh, prostheses or devices that are attached to the body to replace some kind of function that might be lost due to injury or illness. Um, you probably see people walk around town with two robotic lower legs. This is very common nowadays. Um, I mostly work in, in upper limbs, in hands and arms. And in this case, uh, it's not, we, we're, we're not limited anymore to simple hooks and cables. We actually have very advanced robots. We have, uh, um, like, we have some that we built in our lab, like this Avenger arm up there. Uh, there's some very advanced systems that came out of, out of the Johns Hopkins University. And so we have really fancy robots, but there's all sorts of barriers for people actually using them. Not enough to make a good robot, as we saw in the, in the last talk. If you can have a robot, make the robot do what you want, is something very challenging. If that robot's attached to your body, and there's information flowing back and forth on a regular basis in a wild, squishy world where you can't even assign class labels to anything, suddenly this is a very, very challenging problem. Uh, and what it really amounts to is you saw maybe with Jen and the, the brain interface, and, and Jesse with his 
his, uh, his peripheral interface, is that it comes down to really controlling what amounts to something like a fighter jet with an Atari joystick. Like, it's a really hard problem. You give people a limited number of channels into the, into the system they're trying to control, and expect people to do a massive number of things. Um, I'm going to skip over the, the surgeries. Uh, and mainly, this is, this is a challenge of trying to, to funnel up from the, the small number of ways to measure what the person wants the system to do. And this could be you and your smartphone, right? I'm not just talking about brain body machine interfaces in terms of, of like this that connects to your wetware. You can think of this the same as you want someone to use an app or a device. There's a limited number of channels you have for someone to give information to a system, and the, you might want that system to do a, limit, a limitless number of things. Uh, the number of controllable functions outnumber those, those, uh, those channels you can give into. Here's an example from our lab. This is a picture from my lab um, where we actually have a uh, one more advanced bionic limb to the planet, probably the most advanced bionic limb on the planet, and in a second you'll see it start moving. Um, and arguably, this system can perform almost to a first approximation all of the all the motions of a biological limb system. This is uh, this is running on your telop right now, but it's a fairly advanced limb. It's got massive real time data streams. It's got like 16 capacitive sensors in every finger, fingerprints, it's got fingernails. It has temperature sensors all over this thing. Um, it's a very advanced uh, a very advanced arm. We're learn we have an architecture that's learning like literally tens of thousands of facts in real time uh, using reinforced learning from this particular stream of data. Uh, it's a fancy fancy robot. But when you try to get it to do something simple, if it, under human control or otherwise, like shake hands with my student Gotham here, you can see that there's actually a, a, it doesn't look very natural. And this is the case for anybody using technologies like this, is that although the systems are able to do many, many things, uh, what actually comes out the other end is, is a very crude approximation of, of real biological movement, of real control. The user's will is not being mapped with them. Uh, and this is true, I think, for all sorts of assistive devices. Again, everything from cell phones to buying body parts is that devices of the future are going to receive even more data in real time. This isn't going down. This is, we're getting cheaper sensors. Our devices are populated with all these ways of receiving information from the user, from the world, and the relationship between those two things. Um, and that stream of data needs to be very skillfully leveraged to actually do something useful. What we're seeing now, and, and machine intelligence, machine learning is one way to begin to do this, is that devices are now taking an active role in them. If you think about going back to my initial example of a, of a robotic hand versus like a, a hook and cable, a simple like Captain Hook hook, um, that, that system was static. It didn't change. The person had to adapt to the technology. We're now seeing systems that can begin to adapt to the user, and the machine intelligence is, is really one of the things that allows that technology to begin to adapt to its use. Schools ever tracking so far? That could, that's sort of like my big pitch for the, for the first bit. And, and really it's that I want, I want us to all think about, oh, I'm going to put a cool video on another robot arm there. I'm sorry, no, we have to get going anyway. Um, so that's the first pitch, is that devices interact with people all the time, and there's data coming up that needs to be used not in batches, but in real time. Every single microsecond you get data, you should be able to learn from that data and improve the device, so that it better adapts to the people using that device, that technology, that system, that app, that platform. Cool, is everyone okay with that for now? We can move on to measuring stuff. So I'm going to try very hard to understand how to measure I got time? Okay, awesome. Uh, so view two is like, how would we start to measure, analyze the data coming out of the interactions between a person and their device? So this is a very, I think it's also something very fundamental. If we're trying to increase the capacity of our technology to adapt to users, to, to potentially customize and optimize for individual users, how do we measure whether or not that actually helps? The natural thing, be like, hey, cool, I've got this like amazing reinforcement learning technology. I've got a deep learning framework. I want to throw this into my app because it's going to be better. How do we know? So really, a call to action is we need to find better ways to analyze the performance of people with their technology. In the prosthetic limb sense, I could really ask the question, if I were to stick on a limb to someone, and that had only a wrist, or it had a wrist and a hand open closed, or maybe this person could actually move their individual fingers, does adding any of those individual motions to the things they could control change their performance. Can they do things in daily life, like pick up a cup, or hold their child, or dress themselves independently? So does that actually change something? There's the, the engineering approach, which really to, to continue to improve the control system, but we need to know, does that help? Uh, so what we were doing this is actually, uh, um, is through the DARPA Haptics program. Some of you may know the Defense and Advanced Research Projects Agency in the United States. Uh, here at UVA, we have a, a DARPA contract as part of their Haptics program. And Haptics is a program to uh, develop bi-directional links between humans and machines, specifically upper limb prosthetics, such that someone could control one of those fancy pantsy limbs I showed you earlier and be able to feel exactly what that limb is feeling. So this is a, a very advanced project stream. We're doing the metrics for it. 
So we're not really looking at, at closing that loop. We're looking at providing a new gold standard for measuring how a person and their device are interacting, measuring them, measuring their decision making, and then saying when we make a small change to the technology, whether or not that made it better. And no surprise, that's also like a lot of data. It's a big stream of data. Some of it's real time, some of it's in batches. So I mean, both camps, whether you have batches of data or real time data, it involves both of those things. So analyzing that data is now fundamental to actually deciding how we start to make other systems that also analyze data. Turtles all the way down. All right. Uh, so what we felt, I'm just gonna, this is a, a very sort of late, late breaking snapshot is we very recently, uh, um, showcase the first uh, first iteration of the system that we call Gamma. Uh, as part of this haptics program, uh, we built something called Gaze and Movement Assessment. And I, this might, I, I threw this in because I thought it might interest some of the others here. I don't know again all of your, your, your scopes of work, but maybe this is exciting to people. Um, we're looking at uh, fusing human motion analysis and eye tracking. So to assess how well, in this case specifically, how well someone's using a, a bionic body part, maybe a bionic body part that is increasingly intelligent and able to adapt to them, we're looking at measuring things like how they move, how they compensate, and how they work around their technology, how they precisely control that terminal device of their, their robotic body parts, and also things like how they attend to the different things they're working with. Um, some measures of their cognitive demand, the level of like visual and other compensation for the things that their limb might or might have, the technology might or might not have. Um, we have a range of tasks, I'm not gonna talk about the tasks, we have we're developing also a range of tasks specifically for upper limb prosthetic assessment. I uh, figured none of you, has anyone here worked in rehab or before occupational therapy? No, so I left that slide out because I figured that was not gonna be the thing that, that most of you care about, but I have to talk about it later. Uh, but I do wanna show what we can actually see with this. This is a person using the, the gaze motion analysis um, framework that we have doing a simple task. And as you watch as they're moving, we can actually analyze the motion of all the parts of their body and also where they're looking. Um, and so just go back, I'd like to, and then, okay, I'll move it, that's great. Um, let's do it one time. If you watch, something really important here, I just wanna highlight one thing that we can learn from this, what amounts to a very detailed stream of information. There's all sorts of, uh, of real world data coming in here that you can see that when the person picks something up, they grab the object, and they're looking at where they're going to put it before they even start moving. So they've already like grabbed something, like if I were to grab this pen, I'm already looking at like, who can chuck that in the audience. Um, this is not the case when you see someone with a, with a different kind of body and a different kind of technology. Um, so here's actually one of our, our users with a prosthesis and uh, doing the same task. This is a, a mechanical, electromechanical hook. So this is a person working with a technology interpreting signals in real time from their body. And what you might notice here is that this person's actually staring at their hand while they're moving the cup over that barrier. So this is, I'm, I'm using this as one very crisp uh, example of a whole set of examples of ways that we can measure the interactions between someone and the technology, measure the different things that they're doing. Uh, we actually have a new grant now to do uh, capture brain information as well, to be EEG, galvanic skin responses, force plates, all wireless to, to really measure human decision making. And this is a massive data stream. It's coming in, in real time. It can be analyzed in real time. It can be analyzed post hoc. Um, but this is just highlighting one of those small details that you can pick out of the stream of information used to better analyze the interactions between, in this case, a person with prosthetic technology and, uh, and different kinds of technology. You can imagine if we gave this person now a, a robot hand with fingers, they could open and close their fingers. We could also look at how this changes. We could look at how they, they change their tension, how they change the way they move their body, maybe the way they compensate their body. Every single point on his body is a data stream. It involves different rotations and translations. The way his eyes are moving are also data streams. This is a big real-time data stream. Uh, and so we've built this into uh, an actual uh, toolkit. This is not maybe as interesting as everyone else, but, but what we also do is we do some of the, the let's collect all the data in a batch and look at it too. So this is another, another way that we can look into analyzing uh, the, the interaction with people and machines. Uh, we actually take all of those thousands or tens of thousands of, of data points, all those different features, those different views into the interactions between the person and the machine, and we can use standard data science, data mining uh, technologies to begin to look at which, which features are important. We can cast those features into these large spaces or these large what I call measure spaces. Essentially, you can say which features are important, let's map them into some big high dimensional space, and then look at distances, look at minimum acceptable distances in some new created space based on the measures, and actually start to quantify. Not just say this is different or this is better, this is worse, but actually make very precise, calibrated, specific measures of how one set of people, like say all these blue dots here, might be all of the normal, the normative people, the people who don't have prosthetics 
uh, devices. And all the people with amputations, other, like in this case, with small data set, are the red and green dots on that side. Those, in, just in this simple space of measures, you can already see differences between those piles of people. This is not limited to, uh, to just prosthetic users. This is a way of thinking about um, casting data into measure spaces and creating and sculpting new measure spaces to assess this. Maybe that's too, maybe that's too, too uh, big, a, big a thing for today. But, uh, and this is just one other view of this where we're looking at, you can start to see the differences between people with different levels of amputation in our normal population. You can start to see how different users with different skills, again, think away from prosthetics, think someone gets a new phone, someone gets a, a new technology, there's someone who already knows how to use their technology. Are they going to be better or worse? Does their rate of change of learning your new system change? These are ways to start to do a better. Uh, take questions. So, concluding remarks. I, 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 one of the things I was pitching to you today, with really the first half of this, this two-part talk, was thinking beyond big data into real-time big data, where you think about learning from and continually updating or improving your your learning machine, your technology, your application, based on the data as it's coming in. That is rich up my skull, a giant fire hose of data coming in from the world. Uh, real-time big data streams are incredibly important, and they're going to only become more common. And there are approaches that we can use to learn from these data streams in real time in a very straightforward way. Uh, I didn't talk about the actual methods because I think it's better to paint this bigger picture. Um, I also want to say that machine intelligence and, and different ways of analyzing massive amounts of data uh, plays a role in how we quantify and study the interactions between people and technology so that we can make better technology. And in my case, this is better bionic body parts. Um, and it's really going beyond system design. A lot of the work that's been done, at least in my field and many other fields, is, is is trying to make better and better control systems, make better and better um, technology in their cases. Uh, but a really valuable area of work, and I think actually probably a very profitable area of work, I'm just going to throw that there, is crucially measuring how machine intelligence actually impacts the ability of users. So this is a really big thing. We're starting to make more intelligent systems, very simple things, like very simple forms of statistics with a fancy hat that we call machine learning. And there's also some very advanced forms of things that might actually someday approach like real human level intelligence. That's an exciting possibility. As we start to integrate that into people's workflows, into the interactions between people and their technology, uh, how does it change those interactions? How does it change people's abilities? I think this is an area that we need to start thinking of, and I think it's an area that actually could be something that is of great commercial value. Uh, so that's, that's I think, the end of my talk. I do, what do I do? We can also like collaborators, especially ones in bold for the haptic tour, because that's awesome. Um, a lot of funders. I have to say that the, like the haptic stuff is supported by the haptics program, and but thank you very much, and let's, let's take some questions. Yeah, go. Just curious, so most of the uh, adaptation that you talked about in terms of adapting the, yeah. your, the machine learning models and the RNNs that you deploy happen out, seems to happen as you gather data from, when, from a user's uh, uh, application of that particular biomic arm or whatever. Yeah. Is there any uh, research direction in terms of having the, the uh, neural network adapt to that individual? Absolutely. So my entire so life's work for the last seven, my entire life for the last seven years has been getting devices to adapt to individuals as they're using technology. As they're using it. So absolutely. So the answer is yes, and I don't use a single neural net. Okay. For the longest time, I outlawed deep nets in my lab. They keep using, <laughs> the students keep using it anyway, but I'm like, no, no, no deep nets, just do the flat thing first. Just a pad. Because, well, because you can, you can always add the next thing on and it'll add extra abilities, but uh, so you probably want to know how that works. Well, how it works, what controls do you put on it, and yeah. how do you learn from that experience? Yeah. So you've made, things have made, gone a lot better for this guy with one arm. How does yeah. that get better for me with one arm? Absolutely. Cool. So I mean, uh, first, my viewpoint, and the line I take in my work that I think is most interesting, is something that's really strictly incremental. What do I mean by that? I mean, I never store data. Don't store any data. But as soon as the data point comes in, it's processed, it's added into the the, the repository of essentially learned values that a system has access to, and it can be deployed right away. So your your memory, your computation never grows in time. So th that's my like where I ground myself because I think it's super interesting. And, Just as a principle. And it's scalable. Okay. So it's very scalable. Uh, the the robot arm I showed you, while it was moving, it was learning uh, eighteen thousand eight hundred different facts about its experience. It was predicting the future of its motion, its velocity, the forces people will apply against it, how its temperatures will change. It was actually also learning when it was wrong about those predictions. It was learning to predict when it was going to be wrong in the future. And, and all of that was happening in real time. 
And so, first part of your question is really about that. I'm going to, I'm going to cast into that learning process. Yeah. There's a very nice way that you can think about this is really the foundation of reinforcement learning is that you can start to look at how you change what you've learned, um, not based on some large set of data that you've collected, but really by making a guess and seeing how what you actually see changes from that, that guess plus what you just received. So, it's updating a guess with a guess. And you can, very, in a very in a strictly incremental way, begin to change your forecast about the future. And so what we do is we use those forecasts to, to streamline the interfaces between the person and their limb. So a really simple example might be, hey, I'm reaching down for something. The next thing I'm going to do is probably rotate my wrist, and I'm going to close my hand. Um, if, if there's a, a forecast about the, that flow of motion, about the pattern that might be used, next time someone reaches down, they're like, oh, hey, what did we get this last time? You turned your wrist. I yeah. predicted that. And it happened. And I just, it just happened again. So now when they're doing it, the system, then we've explored many different ways to do this, uh, control learning and prediction learning with some hardware and control systems, to actually begin to use those forecasts about the future to allow the system to start to appreciate its grasp or to start to rotate. I had one of my students looking at actually having someone teach a bionic arm with their biological arm, who just defended his thesis last, last month. Um, so there's ways you can start to build up forecasts about the future. And in a really, sometimes really boring, basic, straightforward way, use those predictions to modulate, modify, or twiddle the knobs of a control system that you already know and love and that might probably be deployed. Um, then now, that it allows the system to learn from data and to watch what someone does and to adapt to individuals, to transfer to other people. Um, there's no saying that you have to start from tabula rasa. I always like to start from a blank slate. Here's a learning system, here's a person. Let's study how they co-adapt. Uh, you could imagine, though, having systems that with a good enough representation, a good enough view into the data stream, that they could actually begin to start with a information from many, many different users and could transfer information from one user to the other such that when they get a starting point, they continue to improve from that starting point. So it's from an archetypical person rather than as, a, as opposed to like random control policy, I need to yeah, pick up then. That's like gonna take you years. But you could imagine starting with, with prototypical users or even populations of users such that uh, the best fit could be established and then you could start moving forward. There's actually some cool work from Italy um, moved by uh, people like Claudia Pasolini and Robert Kuzi Caputo, who have looked at saying, in a, in a supervised learning kind of sense, taking a whole set of models from different populations, and when someone uses some kind of prosthetic device, it figures out which one's the best fit, and then gives them that, or combines together, like you plus you plus a little bit of you and 20% of Gaina, and then suddenly you have a, a really good starting point for, for, uh, for an individual. Um, the kind of what I pursue would say, now that we have that good fit, uh, let's let the system continue to improve from that. And it doesn't matter whether you start from scratch or whether you start from a, a good starting point. They're both compatible, and after you've learned for a little while, after a system's adapted to the changes in your life and your needs, there's no saying that you couldn't be like, hey, I'm going to donate my data back and have it translate over to someone else's device. Yeah. I say device because this isn't just prosthetics. We've actually shown a little bit on cell phones. It's cool. Uh, you, could, you could do this in many different ways. Cool. That, is, that was a long answer to your short question. We have three questions, so let's go. Is that okay? Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, on the last slide or two, you showed some visualizations of uh, sensor data in the, in the measure, measure spaces. Yeah. Like is this that, one? Yeah, exactly. Is that strictly like a visualization and like post hoc analysis tool, or is that representation used in the devices themselves as well? So, this right now, the, the, the one that I'm, that's an excellent question, the, the superficial answer is that uh, what I'm showing you right now is a visualization tool. It's, in fact, a visualization tool which, which uh, sweeps things under the hood. I've only used a, a very small scattering of the possible attributes or values. Um, this, if we, I, I found if you try to show someone a thousand dimensional measure space and visualize it for them, their eyes start bleeding and things, it's just really bad. <laughs> so I promise my collaborators will never show them a thousand dimensional measure spaces ever again. Uh, so this is a three dimensional view, but you can imagine that, that, the, uh, that the N dimensional look into this, this same kind of data, the way you make those, those spaces, it can be used as a post hoc analysis tool. You can get numbers out, single numbers or, or different distributions of numbers. Uh, you can also imagine that this same kind of space can be used in real time. I don't have anything cool and flashy to show you about the use real time, but there's some, again, some straightforward and maybe what might seem like boring ways, also some really exciting, super cool ways that you could do this in real time. Um, but the, uh, for what I'm showing you here, it relies on reporting technologies that might not be available in deployment. Uh, right? Like, I'm not going to send you out in the world. You're like, hey, go out in the world. I'm going to put like little tiny glowing markers, and you have this really icon rig that follows you around <laughs> as you go through the world. Like, uh, like that's not going to happen. So, for this particular data, this is a post hoc analysis tool. But take everything you can imagine from there, and if you have wearables, which I know we all have wearables, who works in wearables? 
Nobody here wants to like, no one has like a sensorized shirt or something that they're using to process data to do stuff with people, no? Wow, I'm shocked. Okay, anyway, uh, if you were that kind of person, then you could imagine you always have access to a data stream, and then you could begin to do this in real time in the exact same way. That that cool? Yes. Awesome. More hard questions? Yeah. Yes, so you mentioned that you're predicting future events yeah. uh, using reinforcement learning. Yep. Uh, so very certain delay between your prediction and when the event actually happens. Yeah. How do you deal with reward? Yeah. Cool. So the answer is reinforcement learning. Uh, so let's step back a lot. Well, let's tear reward on it. So reinforcement learning actually is uh, largely based on something called temporal difference learning. If anyone knows about it, essentially it's like you have a guess and a guess in the reward, and then you sort of see the difference between all of them. And that's how you change what you learn, the structure of your learning machine. Uh, what's cool about that is that it's actually a, a, a process that allows you to ask questions that are very long and with some of the new methods for it, independent of the span until you see the outcome. Uh, so there's very simple ways you can deal with that where you essentially trickle responsibility for a future outcome back. Um, outcome could be any sensory signal you might imagine. I'm, I'm decoupling from reward now. It could be how much light there is in the room, how much lunch was provided, um, like what will happen after I walk outside or I get hit by a taxi. Those are the kinds of things you might, those signals you might measure. Um, and you can actually be largely independent of the span. Now, the longer you need to see, the more you need to experience. If I were to ask you a question about winters, well, you see a winter every year. It's a long one, albeit like it started yesterday. Um, but you, if I were to ask you a question about winters, and I wanted to get a really good answer to that question about winters, I might have to wait many winters because there's there's variability in the data. Uh, so the, the actual span, algorithmically speaking, the span isn't as much of a problem. But in terms of the time you have to wait for your system to learn good answers, if you don't sort of appeal to the approach of CS earlier, where you start with somebody off with a good starting point, um, then span might just require that your the, the window of data you have to see, or the, the number of times you have to see some kind of trajectory through the world, um, might be longer. Uh, another caveat on that is that if your world is um, very well modeled by something called the Markov decision process, then you might have to wait less long. Because then you can really update a guess from a guess. Like if I know that every time I walk into the office over there, Warren like gives me five bucks. And I like if I have that guess, I know that being here is close to me getting five bucks from Warren. Hey. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, but uh, so if if you if you can think about your world as being a sequence of states that are linked together, and you don't have to care about where you came from, but you really need to know only where you are and how that relates to the next place you might go, then you might be able to speed things up a bit. If your world's all crazy, wild, wacky, and breaks all of the all of the actual fundamental things that we know about our algorithms, you might have to wait longer. But it still works. That's the really cool thing. It still works because all the domains I work in are very much not more about decision processes. They're like horrible and that. They're partially observable, awful messes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh well, last questions. Uh, let's go there to there. Okay, you talked about the heuristic you're using to prove the machine. Like the, um, test are you uh, measuring how close it is the mechanical arm is getting to a straight human? Yeah, so, so uh, very, so in that specific example, uh, I'll speak to the focus that we have within the, within the Habit project then. Um, maybe this isn't the question you're asking, but I will tell me if it isn't. Um, the idea is that, hey, I've got a fine body part. I can see how well someone does. I can see how close someone is to someone without an amputation. Sort of, that's a fun kind of ground truth. Um, when they're using the technology that maybe they were prescribed at the hospital. Now let's say that we tweak that technology and we change it to say, hey, you can now feel with your hand. We've got some new technology that lets you start to feel what the arm is feeling. Does that get you closer, farther away? Does it move you like this? In what way does it change how close you are to that normal set? Uh, and so this is a very slow loop. Like when I, this is not a, this is a technology iteration loop now. Um, that happens maybe that span of months or years. So that's, that's the large loop. Um, that's in the that's when we're looking at those more global measures of how someone compares to normal population. Um, do you want to know the heuristic for when something's actually interacting with someone in real time in Ruby? Oh, well, I was just wondering more of the software side of the. Okay, so that that loop is very much a multiple teams working together to make better technologies for the human race kind of loop. Um, I think the question you're asking about on the software side, what kind of heuristics might you might you want to deploy? And using, let's pretend that you have a space like this, or maybe maybe we go back to the, the earlier slides I showed where you have someone with an arm attached to their body. Um, what you might, a very simple heuristic, and I'm just going to give this here a scale because I think it's a really nice one, uh, is that 
if you predict something, it's more likely. Let's say that, let's say a person has a control interface and has like five options in it. This is the heuristic I think that, that carries over as well. Someone has five options in that in that interface, and if you predict that they're more, most likely to use option number one or option number three, uh, when you sort of give them a list of options, give them the ones you predict they're going to use first. This happens in our computers every day. It's a really simple, boring, stupid heuristic where you're like, let's just figure out what people use and we'll keep stats on it, and we'll we'll actually give them what they want when they want it. Um, and if they're really, if we're really good at knowing what they want, sometimes we can do the thing they want for them. Now, in a computer, like which app do I open next, kind of thing, or when I look at my swipe on my iPhone, and I see like which apps it recommends to me right now, and start with Edison. Um, that's one setting. When you have someone that's interacting with a very fast loop with a robotic body part that controls their body, that same idea still holds. It's just there's some subtle complexities. That heuristic is the same. Though. Okay, that answers my question. That's okay. Good. Yes, maybe last one. Are we? Where does it go to you? Oh, sorry, everybody. Uh, okay, last question. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, for example, when you, when you train a dog, you can tell the dog uh, whether you or she is lagging or not. Yeah. That's how the, the dog reinforces yeah. the problem learning. But then for the robotic arm, how, how do you tell? So, how do you hormone define your work? Yeah. Uh, how do you tell the robot arm whether it's lagging or not? Cool. So that's actually awesome. So uh, a lot of what I was talking about actually didn't use reward at all. Like I said, we tear the reward off when we use other kinds of signals. If we do, we do have some work on, on using reward as well. That's yeah, important learning. Um, uh, one example is actually right, one of my students is working on this where like, you can just tell it good job. You press a button, it's really slow, it's inefficient. Uh, that's actually a question. So you could, there's, we've explored what happens when you only say good job or bad job after a certain sequence of actions. There's another one where every time the arm is doing a great job, so give it a tap. Um, so there's different ways you can imagine. Now, there's huge limits. So A, it works. So you could just say, like, thumbs up, thumbs down to your arm using different modalities. And it can learn to interpret the signals from your body without you knowing anything about the robot or anything about the signals coming from your body. So right away, that's super cool, but there's huge barriers in that you never want someone to have to always be saying, great, 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 great. Oh, that was awful. Man, that, you're going to the closet. You never want someone to always have to be providing feedback to their system. And so there's there's a lot of people, not just me, there's lots of people working in this particular setting on finding ways to allow the system to learn from even sparser reward and to remember how someone might have trained it in the past so that it can actually, like a dog, like a dog would do, begin to continue to uh, to perform actions without a need for constant feedback. So there's way there, there's actually methods for that as well. So you can actually use supervised learning to build up a model of the user's reward preferences. Brad Knox from the United States did that particular approach. So you could tell whether you did the right thing or not at the end, then yep. the learning takes, takes a lot of time because there are tons of intermediate steps to get to that whole point. Absolutely. So then, you know, yeah. that, if you just saw in the, in the video, the robot arm takes a lot of uh, trial and error to get to the like, word mouth. But then, it, well, although it went to the word yeah. mouth, but the, the intermediate yeah. steps were not so great. And then, how, how can you tell? How can you tell the yeah. robot arm? Those, those things will not work. So there's, there's a whole field of, there's a really cool, there's several overlapping fields that start to help address that, and there's some people that are awesome work in it. I'm not those people, but active learning is one of those fields. Um, uh, one way you might think about dealing with is, yeah, you've got that sort of, like, I put you in a closet arm, and do I ever take you out again kind of reward? It's a very, like, intermittent reward. It happens maybe every day or maybe every week, um, and that can then be trickled back in certain ways to all of the different actions that took place. Um, credit assignment can let us start to say what was responsible for that choice and not responsible. Um, but along the way, there's all sorts of shaping rewards or intermediate rewards. Like uh, one of my students just graduated said was teaching an arm and it was learning from, from the reinforcement as to how close it was to the, the movement of a biological limb. So there's ways that in settings you can to show or describe or demonstrate. This is learning from demonstration, there's learning from learning from sample trajectories. There's all sorts of cool ways you can start to make it tractable and practical. To actually integrate reward in very different ways the biases. So that's, uh, I think, maybe a, a doorway into it. The answer is that there's no really good solved problem, solved way yet to learn from a single one shot reward such that it, on that single one shot reward, it gives you everything you want. Um, we don't have that as a tool yet. Reinforcement is not sure yet. And maybe it can't be because learning takes time. Learning with a puppy takes time. We should expect when users use devices that the device has to learn about them, and that takes time because. Patterns of daily life unfold over days and weeks and months, much like the, the person has learned about that technology over days and weeks and months. We try to streamline it, but I think we're always going to pay a price in time if we want a system that's very flexible and very adaptive.
Uh, and as we engineer the system more and more, the learning time gets shorter and shorter and shorter, but the capacity of that system to actually do all the things that we might want to do also gets smaller and smaller. So it's a trade off. I have to stop now. We're going to leave the answer. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs>